I don't know about you, but when I was a new grad nurse during my first two months of orientation, I had a dedicated supply closet where I would go to cry. I would like schedule in crying on my shift because it was so overwhelming to be a new grad working in critical care. The stakes were so high. I felt like I didn't know how to even navigate my way around and I learned that I really needed to figure out how to grow thick skin. I was a people pleaser. I'm still recovering people pleaser. And I think that this is something that a lot of y'all might have experienced. And I wanted to introduce ourselves. So as we dive into this episode, where we're going to talk about growing thick skin in critical care. My name is Anna. I was a ICU nurse for about three years. I started off in the CV SICU and then I was a COVID travel nurse for two years. And this is my business partner. Hi, I'm Chrissy. I'm a nurse anesthetist. I've been a CRNA for six years now. And before that, I was a CV ICU nurse as well. Together, we started Confident Care Academy about a year and a half ago now, which is designed for people who want to dig deeper. If you're working in cl critical care, you have questions about pharmacology and pathophysiology, that's why we created Confident Care Academy. So you can definitely check out the membership if you're interested in lectures about pharmacology, pathophysiology. We also have this podcast where we dive into these topics. We talk about this stuff for free, and we're really excited about this episode because today we're covering growing thick skin, not only as a new grad ICU nurse, but also what it looks like to build resiliency as a SRNA. If you are a nurse, if you are an ICU nurse, and then we're going to close out the episode with tips from Chrissy from what she expects from her SRNAs in the operating room because she was a former cl clinical yeah, site so coordinator. So as we're diving in, very first thing here, Chrissy, uh, what was your experience like when you were a new grad nurse? Um, that was a really rough start for me. I've told the story on this podcast many times, but like a bridged version. Uh, I was a second degree accelerated nursing program student. So that meant that nursing was my second degree. It was a 12 month program and I had zero exposure to critical care. I didn't do any nurse externships. I didn't have a senior year preceptorship. And on top of that, um, I got straight into an ICU by chance I was babysitting for someone. They gave me, um, gave my resume to my nurse manager and I got the job. And at the same time, um, uh, my sister died two weeks before I started orientation. So I was already um, underprepared for the ICU and I was already um, extra emotionally fragile at the time for a variety of reasons. And then I went into an environment that was really quite harsh. Um, critical care, you know, medicine in general is known for being very harsh. Um, people do not sugarcoat things. People do not handhold the expectation once you're professional is that you're going to do and perform. And when you aren't ready uh, to show up 100%, you will be publicly shamed oftentimes into performance. Um, and then ICUs are notorious for being, you know, extra challenging for that reason. And then, oh, my preceptors as well. Um, one of my primary preceptors was a night shift nurse. So I didn't get to work with her towards the end until towards the end of my orientation. And my day shift primary preceptor quit in the beginning of my orientation. So almost every shift for the first half of orientation, I was with a completely different person. So no consistency, um, just really, I was pretty much set up for failure. So what tips do you have for new grads who might find themselves in a similar position? <laughs> it's a lot, oh, right? I just got a DM the other day from um, one of the nurses that was in my cohort. I was so lucky to be in a gr new grad nursing cohort where there were six of us who started together. One person did um, end up choosing to move to another floor, but the five of us who remained stuck together and were such awesome supports to each other. So the first thing I could think of right off the top of my head is, you know, find support with your colleagues, like find your nursing besties, your ride or dies who are safe people you can talk to and cry to. Um, but the second thing is that, you know, I got a DM from Ashley, one of the nurses who grew up with me, one of my fellow baby nurses. And we all keep in touch still, by the way, like this is 2013. We're still all like we all still message each other 10 years later. Um, but she is travel nursing right now. And she just ran into a nurse on her unit who just graduated. And her uh, nurse residency program was canceled. She's no longer going to have a cohort of new grads to go with. She's not going to have classes anymore. She's just going to get an abbreviated, 
an abbreviated orientation and it's going to be sink or swim for her. Um, this girl is completely set up for failure as well. So Ashley reached out to me and asked, you know, if she said that she recommended confident care Academy to her, this is like not meant to be a plug, but you know, I guess it's an accidental plug, but basically, you know, trying to get her in support and community with other people who are going through what she is as well as getting just that extra educational boost. So really like what you need is mentorship and community to kind of carry you through as well as digging into those outside educational resources. And that's what ultimately helped me survive that environment. I think that really resonates with me as well. And I think it's wild for people to realize that you're not going to receive all the training that you need to do your job on the job. It's not possible. Right? We, nurses have to do too much. I remember starting off as a new grad nurse, and I think there's a lot that comes with being a new grad nurse that's hard. For a lot of people, it's their first job, really. Like, I had worked full-time through nursing school as a nursing assistant in critical care, so I was grateful to have that exposure to just, you know, working around all of the monitors and all of the devices in the ICU. But there's a lot of things happening at the same time where when you're a new grad ICU nurse, it's your first big girl job. You're working in a high stakes environment. People are sometimes mean, honestly, like let's Often. call it what it is. The patients are very sick and you've put hot, you put high standards and a lot of pressure like on yourself. And I think one of the things that really hindered my ability to grow faster was this mindset of being a people pleaser and being a perfectionist as a new grad. Because the reality is that I was a beginner. I was a novice. And you learn in nursing school about the like, what is it? The novice to novice, expert? Yeah, is that what novice it is? Expert. Expert. There's the uh, five I'm stages. Like, novice is like when you're a fresh new grad. Yeah, that is ringing a bell. But when you're a new grad or when you're a novice, it's not possible to be an expert. And so if I had stepped in and been very much more embracing receiving as much feedback as possible and not taking feedback as a negative reflection on my value as a person or on my like value as a nurse. I think I would have learned more faster if I had let go of like that perfectionism and that people pleasing Ooh. as a new grad. Do you relate to that whatsoever, yeah, Chrissy? I, I actually want to ask you a little bit more about that. I really think that's a very key point you just <laughs> brought up there. So, you know, Perfectionism and people pleasing is such a common combination for healthcare workers in general and people in medicine in general, right? Like you typically go into healthcare because you care about people. You have a big heart. You're compassionate. Um, you might be a little codependent. You might be a people pleaser. I forget what the statistic is, but, um, you know, a large portion of people who go into nursing have some sort of addiction in their family, right? Like these patterns of being a lifelong helper mm. are like set up and ingrained in many of us from day one for various reasons. Um, but when you combine that with that perfectionism, it really sets you up for um, a lot of shame and anxiety. Um, and yes. you almost have to experience an ego death in order to receive criticism, whether it's given to you harshly or in a more kind manner and be willing to like absorb all the feedback and integrate it and grow. How did you get through that? Like perfectionism, people pleasing anxiety spiral. Like what helped you kind of move past that and mature? I did not <laughs> react well to it at first. And let me share a story about a mistake that I made and how I moved on like through that. So I had a medication error as a new grad. I think I've been a nurse for mm, like a month and a half or something like that. And I gave hydralazine instead of Ativan to a patient. I didn't scan it. I should have double checked it. I think we actually maybe talked about this in another podcast episode yeah. where like in the transition to working in the operating room, like you don't use scanners in anesthesia. So like some of those kind of safety rails are kind of not incorporated. I know Christy's probably laughing. I can't see her right now, but I like, I can hear her like laughing in spirit. The guardrails are but off. But as a new grad, I made a, I made, as a new grad, I made a medication error and I, the guardrails are off and the standards are much higher, like, which th this gets into later in the episode. We're talking about the transition again in grad school and like growing thick skin in grad school. 
So as a new grad, I made a medication error. I reported it. I did the RL. I don't know what you guys call it where you're at, but I reported it. I talked to the provider. The patient ended up being okay. But in the meeting that I had then after, because I was on orientation and made a medication error, you go through and you meet with the manager, you meet with like the provider and you talk about all these things. I am in this moment, not and I'm talking to my preceptor throughout this, I felt that the error proved that I wasn't supposed to be there. I thought that because I made a mistake like that, I shouldn't be an ICU nurse. I shouldn't be a nurse that I wasn't like worthy of like how critically ill these patients are. And because what they, what was happening was I was receiving feedback and I was unable to detach my self-worth and identity from that feedback when in fact, it was not a, it was never intended to be a, you need to get out of the ICU. It was a, how can we troubleshoot so this doesn't happen next time? So that was a huge learning experience. And my preceptor, who was Albert, we love Albert. He, you know, he was in his fifties and he'd been a nurse for like 17 years. And he sees me getting in my head like this. And he's like, I don't like this self-talk that you have going on that you don't deserve to be here because you don't know everything the very first time. And because you made a mistake. He's like, if you believe that about yourself, like you're going to be right. So that was the very beginning of realizing that if I was going to set myself up that I needed to know everything as a new grad and that if I did make a mistake or if I did receive feedback because I didn't know everything that I, that that was confirmation of that imposter syndrome that I didn't belong, then I was Mm. going to fail. So that was like a whole scenario in and of itself where you think that if you don't know everything right as you start, that it's confirmation that you indeed don't belong. Oh, then you're not, then you're self crippling, right? Like you're not able to receive feedback. You're not able to learn. You're not able to push yourself when in fact, what I should have been doing was practicing like safety, right? And like operating with a, Hey, this is my understanding of this. Could you double check it? And like opening, opening myself up to that feedback over and over and over again, I would have learned faster if I had instead been able to see feedback as an opportunity for growth instead of like an attack on my like worth and value oh, as a person. Yes. If that and I makes think sense. that is such a key point to drive home and something I struggled with as well. I felt that I had to do everything and do it perfectly and do it myself in order to be seen by my colleagues as a good nurse mm-hmm. and in order to be a good nurse. And <laughs> It couldn't be farther from the truth. I mean, I think that that message had gotten kind of communicated to me by the toxic culture of the unit, right? When you have senior nurses who you ask a question and the response is, oh, you don't know that. Or you go to one of the providers and they're like, oh, like you shouldn't be asking me that. Like you should already know this. Like that kind of like shame-based response sort of reinforces that idea. Um, and then, you know, just seeing like the more skilled advanced nurses around you who just do like kind of already know everything and do do everything by themselves and never need help. Like it's sort of subconsciously, um, taught to you as the new grad that that's how you have to be also. Um, but then you hear people say the opposite, right? Out loud, they say, oh, there's nothing scarier than the new grad who doesn't ask questions. And you're like, well, what questions should I be asking? Well, the questions that people are really seeking that you ask and the type of help that they're really looking for you to seek is help with delegation. Like, hey, um, I have this going on in both rooms at the same time. Mm-hmm. Like, who do you think I should go see first? Like, is there a resource that can help me manage both, um, calling in charge sooner than later when there's an emergency. I remember I had a patient who, Mm. um, went into complete heart block while we were doing morning rounds. Like it happened live in front of us in that moment in time. So I was lucky I already had an NP, a resident and attending like right there. And then another nurse, um, happened to be free and right next to me. And so like she grabbed the code card and grabbed the pads, um, to put on the patient, like while the team's making decisions. And I felt in that moment that I had all the resources I needed. I didn't think about looping in any extra help. And my manager gave me the feedback of, well, you didn't tell the charge nurse. And she's like, that is really important for the charge nurse to know. And I didn't understand why at the time I was just thinking like, well, what would the charge nurse have done? Like I already had help from all of these people. Like what more could have been added to the situation? I didn't have the situational 
awareness or big picture awareness at the time of like the charge nurse needs Mm -hmm. to know if we have to coordinate outside resources or bed management or like go to a procedure or like I didn't realize that the nurse that had gotten the code cart and that had grabbed pads for me she was giving me senior nurse vibes I thought she'd been on the unit much longer than she already was turns out she had been a nurse only six months longer than me she was not an appropriate resource to be helping in this situation like her grabbing stuff quick was helpful in the moment and I And I was grateful for that, but there were other senior nurses around who had the time and resources to give to me and the charge nurse could have facilitated that had I looped in help immediately. And so my manager was like, oh, like the, you know, the attending, like told the charge nurse, like, why wasn't it you? And and I really took that feedback to heart and it hurt my feelings and it made me feel inadequate. And, and I just had all this anxiety about why I'm not good enough, but stepping back, like, even though things weren't always delivered as kindly as I would have appreciated as a sensitive little flower baby new grad nurse. It was all true. And that's kind of the hard thing. Almost all criticism in life, no matter how it's delivered, has at least a grain of truth in it. Even if it's not entirely true, usually there's a tiny, a tiny seed of it that might have some truth. So it's really hard to kind of like hear the criticism and feel that like, Oof, that like sickening pit in your stomach feeling and sort of take a deep breath and filter out like, okay, what's true? What's not true? What's just my own negative self-talk versus, um, you know, what I'm actually hearing? Like, what are the words that are actually coming out of that person's mouth? And how do I get better? How do I move forward? And so pivoting from me having that mindset of having to do everything to be good to, learning to communicate everything to be good. And once I switched from trying to do everything myself to communicating to everyone around me, all the nurses in my pod, looping in charge immediately, I had several more you know, emergencies come up over the next several months as a nurse. I was on a very high acuity unit. Things were constantly happening, but looping in charge immediately every single time helped establish trust with the team um, and helped me appear and become more competent and confident and made me a resource very quickly um, and a source of knowledge and a trusted nurse very quickly when just a few months prior, I was the new grad drowning. That's so huge. And this is a lot of this is reminding me of the provider communication episode. If y'all have not heard that and you're a new grad, please go back and listen to that because that is, there's a lot of just communication and critical care tips in that episode and a lot of just really helpful information there overall. But there's two things here. One that you said that the feedback wasn't always delivered kindly, right? And that's where I think that the title of this episode comes in, like growing thick skin, Um, because some of the feedback that you're going to receive It might come in a delivery that (laughs) could be less than optimal. And I remember that was one of the hardest things. So if you, the first step, it sounds like we're both in agreement is that growth mindset and proactive communication and opening yourself up to feedback, which is hard, but that's a whole lesson in and of itself. And then the second thing is like, okay, well, how do you take that feedback when it's not delivered very kindly? Do you have any experiences that you want to share about not super kindly delivered feedback oh. and any tips for people who might be in a similar position so now. Hard. I mean, I, I, oh my God, a million times. <laughs> I'm thinking about one of the times right. I was in CRD school. I laugh at this story because sometimes like, like I love the, um, like all of my students so much and like the people I precept so much, but sometimes like they, um, you know, when I hear people like not being pleased with how something's communicated with them, like I'll tell this story about how I was, um, like six months into CRNA, uh, not into CRNA school. I was in the OR for like, actually maybe it was only three or four months. I don't know. We were like coming, we were in our second semester of clinical rotations and we were going to start taking overnight call soon. And you get a lot more autonomy when you're on call at this clinical site and you're in charge of a lot more. And I hadn't had that much experience with LMAs yet. It's a laryngeal mask airway. It's a airway that we place in anesthesia to um, be able to deliver breathing gases to you. And we can take over your breathing if we need to, when we need a deeper anesthetic, general anesthesia, but, um, but we don't think you're at a higher risk for aspiration and we don't need to place a breathing tube. So it's like another option. And, um, you know, the old school way to use LMAs, because you used to 
have to avoid positive pressure with some of the old school models is you would always want to get the patient back breathing on their own. So like it's a device, but the patient's supposed to breathe on their own through it, or you could assist a little bit, but you weren't really supposed to put them on the ventilator in the old days. Now, now they're more evolved. And they're, they're harder to place, they're hard. I think. I think they're harder to place than ET yeah, tubes. Yeah, they can personally. be actually. Um, so, you know, we induce anesthesia, place the LMA, and the patient's not back breathing yet. And they're apneic and we're waiting. And like just learning the art of like how often do you like ventilate? Like how do you get the patient back breathing where you're not letting them be apneic for too long? And like balancing the art of building up CO2, but also not letting them get hypoxemic and all these things. And so, you know, the patient was apneic for a while and, and we're also doing other things, right? Like we are putting on the bear hugger and putting in a temperature probe and like doing all these little tasks that you have to do after you put the patient to sleep and you get tunnel vision when you're new, you're kind of in the weeds. So I'm like not noticing that the patient's like still not breathing and probably due for another breath. And <laughs> my preceptor's like, like, what are you forgetting? I'm like, I don't know. And she's like, is your patient breathing or not? I was like, what? It's just like, is the patient breathing or not? And I was like, oh, it's just like breathing, not breathing. It's not that hard. You have to know this. You're going to be on call soon. And she rips out the LMA, throws it across the room. <laughs> And he puts a, a mask over the patient and she's like, you're going to hand mask ventilate the rest of the case. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> and in that moment, it was so scary <laughs> and so harsh, but she was a hundred percent right. Like that was the most important thing to know about the patient in that moment. And I was getting tunnel vision and tasks. And that is something you absolutely have to know, like very early on. And I was not in a position to be ready to take call. And I did need a little bit of that kick in the pants. Oh, and then she said, she's like, you're way behind your peers. I was like, ouch. <laughs> and I think I was a little by behind my peers, truthfully, um, because, you know, I didn't have as much nursing experience. And we can talk about that later in the episode. But Oh, that was a good kick in the pants. But she was right. Ugh. She was 100% right. Brutal. The delivery was not fun, but she was right. And I took that advice to heart and I really seriously upped my game in preparing for clinicals. And I did become better and I did catch up. So, you know, the, okay, you have to experience that ego death, right? When you have that harsh feedback. Yes, it hurts your feelings. Mm. Yes, it's uncomfortable. Was she right? Also, Yes. Okay, so what am I going to do about it? Really having that like uncomfy feeling and turning it into an action. So, like, yeah. okay, yeah, that hurt my feelings. Um, does it mean I'll always be behind my peers? No. Does it mean I'm never going to be a good CRNA? No. I'm still a beginner. I still have a lot of learning to go. Let me channel this into a healthy fear. I talk about this all the time. Um, mm -hmm. Instead of just beating myself up and letting imposter syndrome get the best of me and saying I suck, it's okay. You know what? Today I'm going to go home and I'm going to study. And the next time I'm in the OR, I'm going to pay way better attention to alarms and just really focus on my vigilance and then verbalize with preceptors. Hey, I want to work on my vigilance and like listening out for alarms. Like, can you do me a favor? And like, don't point them out to me. Like, let me identify it myself. And like taking an active step in your learning is really key. And you can do this in the ICU too. Like telling people while you're still in orientation, what you know you need to work on and finding ways to have people enable you to work on them. Hey, um, I'm still bad at time management or prioritization. Like, can I practice doing this alone? Or can I tell you how I think the day should be structured? And then you give me feedback. Or if you're already a nurse for a while, right? Like, Hey, um, if somebody think... gives you that harsh feedback, asking for putting them in the position of being a teacher and asking them for feedback that's constructive is a good way to, you know, like, okay, I hear what you're saying. I appreciate the feedback. Um, do you have any advice for me about how you would go about it is a way to kind of diffuse the tension. hundred percent. I think in that story, there was a moment to me that was a big takeaway for people who were in a position to of being new. And that was that you couldn't when, I mean, even in that situation, someone was yelling at you and they threw something across <laughs> the, the room. Was that appropriate in the way that that Stop was optimal. communicated? Arguably not. <laughs> But what did you, what did you have to do in that moment? You weren't able to just leave the room crying. And like, that's kind of the reality of like working in critical care is like, I have a story that I'll share where there was poor delivery and it was just mean. And there wasn't really like 
a moral coming out of that other than like you did have to get through it. So I had, I was admitting this cardiac patient and I was a new grad. So I was on orientation. And if you work in a surgical ICU, you know, sometimes like if it's a big cardiac case, like there's like 15 people in the room during admission. Right. So I had my attending at the time make this whole kind of production out of the cardiac admissions. And so when, as soon as I like take the pumps from anesthesia, plug it in, I'm checking pupils, I'm checking the pacemaker, I'm checking my drips, you do the whole thing with an admission. And then as I'm on orientation, he kind of hollers from across the room. He's like, Anna, what are your patient's pacemaker settings? And I was not getting capture on this pacemaker because the wires were, I was not getting capture because it wasn't working. So I tell him that. And then he says, gentlemen, what did we learn? We learned that Anna doesn't know how to check a pacemaker in front of like 15 so people. It's like public humiliation. That wasn't really constructive. It's not constructive. I was a learner. Uh, he was also wrong, actually. Like <laughs> we ended up needing to like adjust the wires because nobody else is getting capture either. So that's like an example of like sometimes the harsh feedback is appropriate. I mean, like sometimes the harsh feedback, the delivery is not great, but they're right. And sometimes people are just bullies, to be mm. honest with you. Like you're probably going to experience that too. But in the moment, there is an element of you do have to then like put one foot in front of the other and then get through it. And then also with that ego death, like not take it personally, you know, like that guy, he is, you know, utilizing whatever's going on in his personal life to kind of stomp on the new grad. Was that appropriate? No, it was not. There wasn't really a lesson there. There wasn't a silver lining to that sort of quote unquote feedback that was utilizing a position of authority to kind of stomp on a new grad. And that is not great. <laughs> but in terms of like growing thick skin and attaching your identity to receiving harsh feedback and the need to be perfect, there's still like a lesson to be learned there. Mm. And the lesson to be learned there is that that guy doesn't determine my self-worth. I'm still a good nurse, even if he's a bully, even if, and even if... I am still a learning nurse. You know, you don't come out of the womb of nursing school, a perfect nurse. Even if the pacemaker hadn't been working, I still have self-worth outside of that guy's perception of me, which really then ties into like other people's perception of you and self-worth, which we're going to get into, into point number three, which is just general tips for growing thick skin in general. But as we're leading into the next point, I think it's going to be interesting now to talk about like that transition from being like a new grad ICU nurse to then being a student registered nurse anesthetist or an RRNA. And I am now kind of in that position again <laughs> of being brand new. I'm like st about to start clinical. I'm in school. And then there's a lot of resiliency and thick skin to grow in didactic as well. Mm. Do you have Chrissy, any tips for people who are in didactic and CRNA school for growing thick skin? I actually kind of want to backtrack before we get into that. Um, I think a really important thing to talk to people about and kind of disseminate here is how do you get through those moments other than like knowing that it happens to everyone and it sucks and sometimes the feedback has truth in it and sometimes it's just someone being a jerk because their wife is leaving them and they're like they got a flat tire that day or whatever their issue is. Um, how do you get through those moments without just falling apart? Like how do you kind of suck it up and get through it? One strategy that I utilized and I think that all nurses eventually learn to develop is compartmentalization. And what I used to do when I would have big feelings at work, even if it wasn't pertaining to, you know, growing, like bullying or anything like that, even if it was just like being in a really sad moment with a patient family, right? Um, you know, people go back and forth in nursing about, is it appropriate to cry with families? And I think the answer is sometimes, but not usually. Um, and I think, you know, we need to not fall apart in rooms or, you know, if your patient codes, you have to be able to walk into the next room and smile. Or if a doctor yells at you or another nurse yells at you, you have to be able to walk into your patient's room and smile. So how do you do that? Um, I like to imagine taking my big feelings and putting them in a box and they go in a box during the shift. I literally visualize in my mind a cardboard box. 
I take slow, deep breaths while I put the feelings in there. I close them and I put them on a shelf. And when I go home that day, I take down the box and I open it and I look at what's inside and I look at it more objectively. Um, I dissect like what was true, what was not true, what was hard for me to see, why, why does something bother me? And then that's when it's time to process things either with a trusted friend or through journaling or to discuss it with a therapist or even just to kind of like sit there and feel the feelings like, you know what, that hurt my feelings, but it doesn't determine my worth and practice that positive self-talk. But how do you get through those moments? Put it in a box, save it for later, but do go back to the box and open it again and address it so that you don't become a bitter old shell of a woman. Um, moving on to, <laughs> yeah, breathing is so good. So kind good. of i think it makes more sense to talk about all of them the how you get through it i had this as point three but i think it makes more sense to talk about now and then we'll kind of close with the grad school stuff okay. so journaling was so huge for me as a new grad nurse and because like we kind of talked about i had a lot of self-worth and identity tied to doing well and being like a good new grad and like being a fast learner. And I had a lot of my identity that was like caught up in that. And so journaling all of those big feelings of if you have a failure at work and you kind of align that with a failure of self, you can't do that or else you'll never get You're never going to learn, right? Like if you aren't able to receive feedback, and learn, then you're never going to get to that next step. So I had to do a lot of journaling of like, oh, I think this charge nurse doesn't like me very much. Okay, well, why do I think that? Which then goes into something that Chrissy and I talk about a lot, which is the thought stopping, mm. which if you're not journaling, Chrissy, do you wanna elaborate about how you use like thought stopping just kind of in general? Yeah, so that's like a cognitive behavioral therapy technique. Um, and we're not therapists, I'm not telling you how to you know, do things. Go see a real one, <laughs> but it is a technique. See a real, th see, see a real therapist. Real therapist. <laughs> I am not your therapist, um, but you know, in CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, this is like one strategy that is used, and it's literally what it sounds like when you are starting to have negative self-talk or intrusive thoughts or you know those feelings of anxiety that are bothering you. Think about like, okay, what is the thought behind the anxiety or the thought behind the fear, and literally stop it. Tell the thought, no, like, okay, mm. no, I don't deserve, like, why am I feeling anxious? Yeah. Because that person yelled at me, like, why did that like hurt my feelings so much? Why is that bothering me so much? Oh, because, um, you know, it makes me feel like I'm not good enough. Like, okay, why does it make me feel like that? Not, not good enough. I'm afraid I don't really belong here. I'm afraid I'm not really capable. Okay. Stop it. And that's when you can start to go into like, you know, that's not true and like redirect. Um, there's also like other, you know, obviously the example I just gave is really more than just thought stopping. Thought stopping is just the technique of like stopping the intrusive thought in the moment and telling it no. And then you can kind of process, but like interrogating your thought process is like also tied in with that, like figuring out the why or like playing things through the end. Like, well, what if that person was right? Like, what would that mean? It would just mean I need to study more, right? Like if that person was right, that I'm not a good nurse. Okay. What's the answer? Like, does it mean I don't, I need to like dissolve off the face of the earth? No, the answer is like, I should probably just like study more and like, okay, maybe everyone should study more. Right. It does. One example there. Yeah. One example there that like hit me like a load of bricks would be the, if I receive feedback from a preceptor, oh, you're behind your peers in anesthesia school. Oh my gosh. That's, that's hard to hear. Okay. <laughs> so then like, okay, well like, what if that's true? Okay. Well, if that's true, then what, what's next? It, yeah. Like, like you said, Chrissy, should I evaporate off the face of the earth and just like, <laughs> no, I should study more. Okay. Like what's the next step to that? And like, that's like, rough feedback to like to receive but also okay then what's next that resonates with me a lot do you find yourself ruminating because i was a big ruminator i used to ruminate i like, used to obsessively replay yes at night i would replay the shift mm -hmm. over and over and over my head and over and over and think that everyone was thinking about me what is that phrase in psychology where it's like um, people who are like teenagers, oh, the spotlight effect, the spotlight effect, like you really, before your frontal lobe is fully developed, yeah. which is why it's mind blowing that we do any professional job in medicine before the age of 25. Like I was such an idiot back then, yeah. but, crazy. um, 
It's like crazy, but, but you kids. really believe Those before kids. your frontal lobe. It's true. Before your frontal lobe is fully developed and especially teenagers experience this, it's called the spotlight effect. It means that like you really feel as though everyone in the world is like looking at you, focusing on you. And like when you walk onto the unit, it's almost like you're a character in a play with a spotlight on you. Everyone's like observing your everything you say and thinking about it and responding to it when in reality everybody's in their own world and we're all the focus of our own world and we only like tangentially interact with other people and like even if someone does give you harsh feedback in the moment or think something not so nice of you or say something not so nice to you you are like a passing fleeting thought in their head like they're not going home to dinner and thinking about you like they're not laying in bed at night and thinking about you they're not talking about you 24 7 like they have their own life and own problem set to worry about you were just a fleeting thought to them on the receiving end especially as a young person you have the opposite effect like they that like one tiny moment that like they don't even remember has completely destroyed your day and like you're ruminating over it for days on end and getting nauseous over it like it's completely out of balance it's 11 p.m and you're replaying the same interaction with that one kind of grouchy charge <laughs> nurse over and over again and just like digging yourself into a hole because you were like i said that you're like i stumbled i mispronounced that word and that charge nurse doesn't like me and then like <laughs> it's really funny i feel like being a new grad in the icu brings up both mommy and daddy issues <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> like you're you're 22 and then you're like oh my gosh all of these like parental figures don't think i'm good enough and that's like bringing up a lot of feelings but like again the ruminating the only thing that i found would stop my ruminating about how i stumbled over charge update would be writing it down and i was like okay that charge nurse got updates on 18 other patients and six other new grads and i guarantee you that she's not going home to her four kids to be like ugh Anna mispronounced levofloxacin like she doesn't care like but she didn't write care. it down because my mind didn't know that but my mind would just play it over and over and over and over again and then I'd roll over and it would be 1 30 a.m and then I would start freaking out because I'm not sleeping enough to go back to work the next day so the only way I could get it out of my head would to be to literally write it down and then <laughs> the spotlight effect I think is something that's hard to understand but then like the more that you're able to then incorporate that into the thought stopping of like okay yeah like they're living their own life she's trying to plan a beach vacation with her three kids and she doesn't care that like care that i accidentally pulled the cinna twice yeah she doesn't care about leave a flock fully planning her next vacation and then i'm like hands shaking pulling out all my meds and she's like looking at her vacation anyway like they don't care about you that much nobody cares <laughs> it's not nobody like, cares it's it's not deep, but it's also not that deep nobody cares oh, which so good. really and then other kind of techniques we talked about this earlier is putting people in the position to teach okay what does that actually mean let's like define that for people because it's like a huge mm. game changer it makes a huge difference what does it mean to put somebody in the position to teach oh <sighs> Well, I guess the best thing I could do is to give an example, right? So when you, again, like receive the harsh feedback or you mess something up in the moment, like a good way to diffuse a situation is to ask them, like, how would they do something? Um, and, and it's really important to have the emotional intelligence to understand when to ask questions like this, how to ask questions like this, to have the right tone. Because if somebody just gives you harsh feedback, like, don't you know this? Like you could have messed up. You could have killed someone. And then if you just come back in that second with like, well, how would you do it? <laughs> how would you do it? That's not going to be <laughs> helpful to that like, sounds like you're being belligerent. Don't like, <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Right. It's important to have situational awareness and like emotional intelligence and know how to talk to people. And that's like a skill to be developed for all of us. But in that moment, um, I think you could diffuse a lot of harsh judgments with a and I hear you or a thank you or an, okay, um, that's good feedback. Um, or okay. I, even if you don't agree with it, okay, I hear your feedback. I understand that and repeat back what you said to them. I understand that this could become a safety concern, or I understand that I need to work on X, Y, Z, whatever it is, kind of verbalize understanding of the situation. It kind of makes the person like, like they know that what they said to you is like getting through. And then you can say in your next breath, 
you know, for my education, for my knowledge, so that I can do it better next time. Would you mind telling me how you do this? Would you mind showing me how you do this? Um, what would you recommend I read? Or do you have something I can study? Ask for some sort of like a, a feedback moment of like, how would they go about things? And 99% of the time, you're going to get that diffusion of attitude and people are going to step up and teach you and they will like you. Every now and then somebody might be busy or like really mm -hmm. just be a jerk and kind of be like, I don't have time for this right now. Like look it up yourself. Like you might just get brushed to the side, but at the very least it will diffuse the situation. At most it will make that person want to mentor you. And like, sometimes you end up becoming friends with people who you thought were a total jerk. And once their wall is broken mm -hmm. down and you find 100%. out it's cause like their dad's dying that they blew up at you, you know, that, Sometimes that kind of changes things too, which by the way, that happened to me in clinical also. I had somebody like yell at me for no reason one day. And then like an hour later, they came back to the room and I asked for feedback in the moment. I said like, okay, do you mind showing me how to do this? And an hour later they came back and they said, Hey, by the way, I'm sorry. I was harsh with you this morning. Like that was totally wrong. Um, my dad just died last night. Like you just never know what mm -hmm. people are going through. That's, that's rough. Anyway, back to what people you were saying. going through rough times. And I, I think the putting people in position of learner or teacher is huge and solidly placing yourself in position of learner. People are, you will de-escalate a situation when you use your words. And I found myself as a new grad sometimes so tunnel vision in whatever I was doing and like having, I always talk about this. I like would have all this stuff in my hands. I'd like be holding all these like IV supplies and like meds. And I don't even know what I was holding in my hands, but I would get like very kind of like sensory overload kind of just like in the moment. And then if I'm receiving like harsh feedback from somebody, I sometimes won't use my words. And then the person who's giving feedback thinks that you're ignoring them or not hearing them. So then they'll escalate. And then you can shut And then like the new grad will then like shut down more because somebody's yelling at them. Like, <laughs> so like if you, you can stop the, that cycle by like initiating that you hear that you hear the feedback, right. To be like, I hear you. Uh, you'd be like, okay. Or thank you for the feedback. Thank you is like a really good diffuser because you're, acknowledging that you're hearing what they're saying. Thank you for the feedback. And then sometimes you are, you know, like literally hanging blood or something. You'd be like, and it's okay to be like, thank you for the feedback. Is it okay if I hang this and then let's chat? Like that is establishing that you like hear them and you're going to talk to them. You're not like ignoring them. And then sometimes if you like, again, if you're like having this thing where someone's giving you feedback and then they're escalating it, escalating it, escalating it. And then you're like shutting down more and more and more that can be like, you're not on different, you're on very different like wavelengths. So establishing the communication of, I hear you. And then receiving the feedback is good when you're, <laughs> when you're a learner. Cause I sometimes would be hearing somebody, but not tell them that I was hearing them. And then the feedback would get harsher because I would not be communicating with them. So yeah, like <laughs> yeah, take a deep breath, collect your thoughts. Acknowledge that somebody's talking. Yeah. Take a deep start, breath. Start with yeah. a thank you. Take and a I deep breath, that. collect your thoughts. And then like, and one thing, learner, right. And one thing as a learner slash as just a new person in town, I was a travel nurse for like two and a half years. And I would then be like the new employee and that didn't mean that I wasn't a good nurse, but people would be very predisposed to giving feedback to me just because they don't know me and they don't know my skill set. And to use those communication skills of reassuring the people around you that you're like safe to practice is mm. big, which then is again, that ego death of not assuming that you're a bad nurse because they don't know you. And like, those things are, it, it's all complicated in like socio emotional intelligence intelligence of just like communicating with the people around you. Because like, by the time I finished travel nursing, I was a pretty decent ICU nurse, but every time you start over at a new unit, they don't know your clinical background. They don't know you. They don't know if you're going to be safe with the patients. So there's this element of distrust that can feel like an attack on your character and your capabilities. If you don't understand where they're then coming from and then proactively communicating there again, which then kind of leads into like being a learner, an adult learner in grad school. And I think this is the rest of the episode is talking about thick skin, resiliency, tips, 
in anesthesia school because, you know, I'll be fully 28 years old. I'm not like 22 when you're in the OR, but you're starting over again, right? You're going back to novice and you're receiving all this harsh <sighs> feedback. And <laughs> I think a lot of SRNAs sometimes struggle with that. How, do you see that, Chrissy? Like they go oh. from being like an expert, like ICU nurse to then like, you know, all thumbs in the OR. Like what's your tips for them? I guess. It's so brutal for them because yeah, a lot of the times you do become very comfortable with being an expert on your unit. Um, people in Syrian A school are in their thirties. Like they have, a lot of people have kids, like they are like fully adults, right? Like you've been an ICU nurse anywhere from, well, I think, um, most CRNA matriculants, um, they have three to five years of ICU experience. It's not counting any other outside nursing experience. Um, and you know, you have people who've been adults for a fully long time who are in school. And now you're going back to not only being a novice, being all thumbs, being awkward and receiving that harsh feedback, but like the stakes are ultra high. Like you in didactic need an 82% or an 85% you know, on an exam to pass, you have to pass, you know, each class in order to move on. Remediation opportunities exist, but vary from school to school. They might be limited. Um, that's tough. And you have a lot of money on the line. Serenade school is expensive. So now you have financial on the line in a way that doesn't, it's not quite the same as an undergrad because now you have bigger bills to pay. People have mortgages, people have mouths to feed outside of them. So it's hard. Um, I guess it comes down to going back to that basic skill of communicating and over communicating. Um, it's normal to go back to that natural state of like getting tunnel visioned, that natural state of feeling defensive. Um, especially a lot of people in Serenade school are perfectionists. Um, and asking for help early and often in the ICU, a lot of the times our emergencies, you can kind of see them coming down the line. In the OR, they happen in seconds. And we don't have the luxury um, in anesthesia. You might be a solo provider. You know, you know, you might be the you might be doing independent anesthesia. You might, um, and like the only other person who's a provider in the room might be a surgeon. Um, you who's like actively performing surgery, right? You might be um, you might have, you know, anesthesiologists in-house who are able to help you, but they may or may not be able to come immediately. Um, you don't have like a big swarm of help available to you in the same way that you do in the ICU either. It's not like team nursing anymore. It's like you plus like one to two other people or maybe only you. So things ha happen in a split second. You have to ask for help early and be vocal and again, have that ego death. I can think of a time when I was a nurse and then again, when I was a CRNA, when like I I think this like example will be helpful for you guys in illustrating what I'm trying to describe. Um, you know, when I was a nurse, I had this patient and, and this has happened to all of us, right? We've all had patients who have a line dampening and you keep the arterial line in place because we're using it for lab draws. This patient is on a heparin drip and they're having their draw, like, you know, their labs drawn a bunch, but they're stable. They're not on pressers anymore. They don't really need the a line, but the provider said we can keep the a line. That's not really working anyway. Um, just because they're having labs drawn so often. Okay, fine. That's like a, that's great. Um, you know, my patient's A-line was dampened. We're not getting an accurate read. We're going off the blood pressure cuff. And, you know, a nurse asks like, hey, like, is your patient's blood pressure okay? What's going on with the A-line? Instead of saying, oh, it's fine. Oh, the A-line's fine. It's just dampened. Communicate with that person in your pod. Hey, the A-line is dampened. We're not using it anymore. We're just leaving it in for lab draws. We're going off the blood pressure cuff, which is cycling every 15 minutes. The patient's been off of pressors and stable for three days. Like those are two very different things, right? Like one seems like the overconfident nurse who might not be paying attention to their patient. The other is showing a full clinical picture. When I got to, you know, CRNA, uh, being a CRNA and I started taking charge, that's when I started learning about how other people functioned around me. Like I had developed that skill as a nurse and as an SRNA of over communicating, but seeing other people graduate in a fresh position, um, you know, residents, new grad CRNAs, like, um, SRNAs, like being in charge of other people and like seeing how the whole workflow of the board worked and like seeing how other people functioned, you start to see those easy beginner mistakes, um, kind of repeating themselves in all facets of anesthesia, right? Like every kind of learner. And 
I can think of a time where I was charged and I was helping a, um, a new provider, um, take care of a patient and, um, and they called me and they said, Oh, we just went, I, they're like, Oh, I'm out of, I'm out of phenylephrine. Like, can you bring more phenylephrine to the room? I'm like, how are you out of phenylephrine? I stocked you up with like five big sticks of Neo. They were like these pharmacy, like pre diluted these like Neo sticks for, um, for drips for the OR. And I'm like, how did you go through them so quickly? Like that should have lasted you a few hours. And it had lasted this person like 30 minutes. And they're like, Oh, I'm up to 250 on the Neo. I, which is a high dose for those of you who are not familiar with phenylephrine. It's a vascular case. Um, so I ran, I just ran into the room and I was like, what's going on? And I said to the provider, I said like, okay, um, like what's going on? Oh, the Neo's at 250. I'm pushing Vaso. I'm pushing Epi. Okay. Well, is the patient bleeding? And they said, no, no, no. I asked the surgeon. The surgeon said they're not bleeding. I stopped and I said, Hey, you know, Dr. So-and-so, um, I think the patient's bleeding, you know, we're up to this on the pressers. Oh my gosh. Like you didn't tell me you were up to this on the pressers, right? Like that was the key communication piece. The new provider had verbalized to the surgeon. Are you bleeding? The surgeon said, no, the new provider didn't give the full picture. Hey, I think there could be an occult bleed. I've just gone from 50 to 250 on the phenylephrine and I'm pushing vasopressin to keep this patient's blood pressure stable, right? So as soon as I communicated that extra piece, Dr. So-and-so stopped the surgery and did imaging with the fluoroscopy bed. It's a vascular case for a vascular room and found a massive retroperitoneal the bleed. So now the, the patient's iliac artery had dissected and they were bleeding into their peritoneal space, which is why the surgeon didn't know they were bleeding. It was internal. So that extra piece of communication and like over communicating allowed us to like address things. I immediately called for help. So instead of, again, just like letting the surgeon fix things and like, just like kind of waiting and seeing and pushing drugs by ourselves in the room, I called, um, the attending anesthesiologist, um, who was running the board and the attending who was covering the room. I was like, get as many people in here as you can. I think this patient's going to code soon. We need blood. We need help. And we got like five people in there and like one person made an A-line. The other person, you know, ordered the blood and called the blood bank. The other person um, grabbed insulin because all of a sudden, like now the patient's having peaked T waves, which, you know, means the potassium level is really high. The other person like drew a blood gas and, and sure enough, like we start pushing insulin and calcium and like we do. Uh, and then like, you know, the patient does code and, and the potassium was like seven and, you know, all these things, right? Like being a proactive communicator is what's going to prevent you from getting into a pickle. And I think that is really what it comes down to. Like having that ego death of like, you know, when you're afraid to ask for help or you think you got it under control, like that's when people get hurt. It's not a failure as a learner to ask for help and be proactive. Like you need to do it because there's a person on the table in front of you and you know, two heads are better than one, six heads are better than two. Right. And that's like something that when you mature as a provider, you start to see it really is about the patient, not about me proving myself as a CRNA. And that is a chilling story of essentially, you know, the provider who was in the room, whether they were a physician, anesthesiologist, resident, SRNA, whoever was in there, you know, they were, you know, given the right medications, they were giving vaso, epi, neo, but the patient was very sick and they should have pulled people in there, which really comes to, it really circles back to what you're saying. Like, you know, at the end of the day, it's about the patient on the table and being proactive with the communication and really practically communicating with the whole team, which I'll just add this as somebody who is like getting started with clinical, I'm really glad that I did not start CRNA school earlier than I did because communication is such a huge piece of that. And I really just don't think it would have been possible for me or, and I think for a lot of nurses to really learn that level of team communication and like big picture zooming out kind of unit level perspective of what's happening with not only your patients, but the patients on the unit. Cause you were talking about kind of your experience in charge, right? And what it's like to pull resources to focus on one really sick patient and I think even back to when I was a new grad nurse and I was, you know, like 23 years old and I would crumple and kind of wither up <laughs> and shrivel away, 
receiving harsh feedback from a surgeon, okay, well, to be a CRNA or an SRNA, you are communicating with that surgeon about your patient and making collaborative decisions. And I think a lot of times people know that they want to go to grad school, but I think that that's something that might get skipped over sometimes. Those kind of team communication pieces of working with people who are much older than you, much your senior about like team communication for the patient. And I think there's just so much to be learned in the ICU about that communication and about that huge, like big picture mindset before going back to grad school. And that's something that like, I definitely needed the time that I had in the ICU before starting grad school, just from that perspective alone, because yes, I think you can kind of go from undergrad into grad school academically if you're a good student. But I think there's a lot to be learned for those communication skills, the ego death, the like taking care of a patient and then working with somebody who's, you know, 40 years older than you and proactively communicating in that way. I think that's something that sometimes might get kind of skipped over when people are looking at grad school. What would you have to say about that, Chrissy? Like, I'm just grateful that I started like when I did and I don't think that I should have started any earlier. Yeah. I mean, I completely agree. I always tell people this. I went back to grad school um, with 19 months of ICU experience. I started applying at the 18 month mark because the wait list for schools in my area were anywhere from like two to four years to actually start CRNA school from the time that I was like doing my applications. And, um, and that was a great timeline for me. I thought, okay, like I'll be an ICU nurse for like either three years, four years, five years, like that'll be perfect. Um, and I got a phone call from school up the street, the university of Pennsylvania. And they said, Hey, can you come down and interview this Friday? You would start school in four weeks from now. And my, actually when I, when they asked me to come down and interview this Friday, I thought I was interviewing for the class the following year. And at the end of my interview, they said, we have spots open, um, for next month. If you'd like to start now, or you could start a year from now and be the first doctoral cohort. So I knew I had this like opportunity to be the last master's cohort and save a lot of money and save a lot of time. And, and I jumped in with both feet and I don't regret that, but it did put me behind my peers in the beginning. Um, and it did make CRNA school harder and it, I was still learning to get over, um, that spotlight effect. I was still developing that maturity piece. I was still, you know, learning to, I went from novice to, I'd say like advanced beginner on the unit. I certainly was not an expert yet. And I think having more experience would have made Serenity school a lot less stressful for me. Um, did I catch up eventually? Sure. But I had to put in a ton of work to get there. And it was with a lot of anxiety. Um, so I never recommend that people go back before they have two years experience. And truly, I do think three to five years is a sweet spot. I mean, people are so different in the OR when I precept SRNAs who have, you know, three or more years versus people that have two, even it's like a night and day, um, experience difference. People communicate better. They're more proactive. They see the big picture. Um, it's just a lot easier for them. Do we catch up the other ones? Yes. But Again, it's, um, it takes a truly exceptional, truly hardworking person. So, um, it's okay if you need more time, there's no rush to the finish line. There's no rush to grad school. Learning is a lifelong process. And I do think that in order to grow thick skin, a big piece of that goes along with maturity, right? Learning to stop being so you focused and be more team focused and patient focused and kind of like stop worrying about yourself being good enough or being perfect and worrying more about the care you provide is probably the easiest way to grow um, as a provider and to develop that thick skin. Like what, again, when you make it about the patient, not yourself, and it will help you in your transition through grad school and beyond. Well said. Please comment what y'all would like for us to talk about next time and definitely come back and check out the provider communication episode. Check out the how to get better grades episode for people who are still currently in school and check out Confident Care Academy, the membership for pharmacology and pathophysiology topics. We love sitting down and chatting with y'all about some of these other kind of not as often talked about aspects of nursing and grad school, travel nursing, anesthesia. And we appreciate your support. Please subscribe, like, follow the podcast, and we will see you next time.